So uh, Kathleen Carroll uh, was a, uh, a lawyer with the uh, California Teacher Credentialing Commission on Teacher Credentials with Credentials Teachers in California and uh, does uh, oversight on different programs that are going on and bullying in the workplace, wouldn't you know it, among teachers. And they found out that they themselves were being bullied. Also, Dr. Uh, Derek Kerr uh, was the doctor at Laguna Honda Hospital here in San Francisco, a city and county employee, and he uh, became a whistleblower about the issue of, of uh, uh, malfeasance, and that's a, a lot of issues that come up in the workplace when people try to solve their problems and then uh, find that they become the enemy and they're the ones that get retaliated against instead of the people who are doing the malfeasance being held accountable. So uh, let's first welcome Dr. Kerr. is whistleblower retaliation. If you uh, report misconduct by a fellow employee, you may get some personal retaliation from that person. And that's a kind of bullying. Yeah. Um, but if you report wrongdoing by a high-level executive who represents the organization, then that's going to trigger organizational retaliation. Organizational retaliation differs from bullying because it's a type of revenge for being a dissenter. It's also designed to teach a lesson, to discourage other people from doing uh, the whistleblowing, and it turns the entire organization against you. Typically, what you get is um, a budget crisis comes up, or they decide that they need to change the programs and your job is eliminated. You may have your workload doubled, and then they find out that you're not keeping up and you have to be demoted. You may get transferred to an undesirable assignment, but they label it a promotion. Then there'll be an anonymous complaint against you, and they have to start an investigation of your conduct. Of course, there's going to be isolation. All of a sudden, you're not invited to meetings, conferences, or committees. And at the same time, increased scrutiny. Your work is put under the microscope. They find something that you didn't do perfectly. And then they initiate a um, disciplinary proceeding to your disadvantage, obviously. So when leaders are corrupt or incompetent, they're easily threatened. They try to protect themselves by keeping control of the workplace, either directly or through lackeys that they appoint. The whistleblower steps outside of the control mechanism and becomes a threat to the power structure, to the way the whole organization functions. So that's why organizations retaliate severely. Now, of course, many organizations will say that they value whistleblowers and they even have whistleblower programs. But the programs are set up by high-level executives to catch low-level wrongdoing, to catch the employees. And they're also set up to protect the organization from negative publicity. They keep it in-house so it doesn't go outside. So obviously these programs are not very effective when the corruption is at the top of the organization. Incidentally, that's true of the city's, uh, San Francisco's whistleblower program and its ethics commission. <laughs> so if you encounter serious wrongdoing that implicates the organization, there's two things that are very important to do. The first is to get a hold of documentation before 
they shred them. Secondly, it's very important to get legal counsel or advice from a whistleblower advocacy group. I wanted to mention two. There's the Government Accountability Project, which is at whistleblower.org. And another one is the National Whistleblower Center at whistleblowers, with an S, dot org. They uh, issue two very good guidebooks. One is the Whistleblower's Handbook, and the other one is the Whistleblower's Survival Guide. And if you're planning to blow the whistle, you should really read these books. This preparation is essential because you cannot trust established whistleblower programs. Also, there are many legal pitfalls in whistleblowing, things about jurisdiction, about uh, statutes of limitations, etc., that you really need a lawyer to help you out. And thirdly, your bosses are getting legal advice. So you should get legal advice too if you're going to be on an equal footing. Once you get some advice, then you go ahead and report the wrongdoing through the established channels. But most likely, what will happen is your complaint will be ignored. If there is an investigation, it'll be a whitewash. And the organization will find out and try to discredit you. The way they discredit whistleblowers is interesting. They create a counter-narrative. And this is a story about the situation that turns you into the wrongdoer. So it helps to report your complaint to several other whistleblower programs, for example, at the state level or the federal level, and you're more likely to have one of them that'll take some action or, or pick it up. When the retaliation starts, you know that the organization has no intention of fixing the problem. You are the problem. So that's when you go back to your attorney and start planning legal action. And at that point, that's when it's safe to expose the wrongdoing to the media and to community groups that would be supportive. And I just want to mention, uh, reiterate what Steve said. We have a little group in the city, the uh, Stop Workplace Bullying Group. I think we have about 25, 30 people. And uh, we have some whistleblowers in that group and uh, gives us support. Now, even if you do get a lawyer, you're going to be in for a tough fight because the retaliation continues even in legal, in litigation. Your adversaries will smear you. They will lose essential documents even though you subpoena them. They will lie under oath. And they'll use all kinds of delays so that it takes years to get the situation settled. So this makes retaliation more intense and more traumatic than most whistleblowers anticipate. There's a lot of stress and you have to expect anxiety, insomnia, depression. It's going to strain your relationships and your health. So it's okay to consult with a therapist, have somebody to talk to, or to see your own doctor for prescriptions for insomnia or the depression. Despite all of this, whistleblowers do recover and can be very happy that they took a stand. This is called post-traumatic growth. <laughs> There's three factors for success, though, and it's important to keep this in mind. The first is to have support from your family. 
you really need to get the approval of your loved ones before you blow the whistle because they're going to turn your life upside down. <coughs> you need to have some economic security. If you have a year's worth of money to, to last through a period of unemployment, that's very helpful. The third thing that helps is to get respect from the public. So let people know about your good work so that they can show appreciation. Thank you very much. So, how many of you are in education? Hands? Okay. Well, uh, educators, and this is a national epidemic of bullying uh, against people in education. And uh, actually, it's starting at the top, unfortunately. And Kathleen Carroll was one of those people who stood up for teachers and education workers. And as a result of that, she's been targeted and really bullied on the job. So, welcome, Kathleen Carroll. Hi, how are you today? And thank you all for uh, coming um, and hearing <laughs> Dr. Kerr is like, that's my story. <laughs> um, as Steve mentioned, I, um, I work for the state of California as a lawyer for the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing. Um, for those in the room that are educators, they know they license teachers, but not just teachers, all certificated personnel, school librarians, nurses, psychologists, um, child care permits, um, uh, uh, PPS, uh, administrative services, so administra school administrators, principals, and the like. Uh, they also um, uh, approve uh, teaching preparation programs and um, administer all the exams that the um, certificated personnel have to take in order to get their license. Um, basically, my story, I, I actually never really told my story in this kind of setting. I, I hear the word bullying uh, put out and certainly that's going on. I, I would almost say it, it's, it's too kind a of word. Um, it, it's, it's more of mental torture. Um, and I'll, I'll describe some of, of what I went through and also what some of my coworkers went through. Um, it started, you know, I, I was a lawyer, so obviously I needed to learn the procedures, the laws. Um, regarding um, how licenses were issued and how um, misconduct was reviewed for educators. And um, it started where I was um, questioning things. I started asking questions and um, quickly noticed that that was frowned upon. Um, the more questions I asked, um, the more work I got. <laughs> in my office and at one point some of my co-workers would almost joke that I had so much cases in my office that how was I able to even get out of the door I literally had cases piled all over the floor all over the desk and um, so they were really trying to bog me down, and I frequently stayed late at night to complete my caseload. So I was reviewing cases of misconduct. I was given side projects, and um, and all my supervisors knew that I have a medical condition. I'm a heart transplant recipient, and um, this would kind of you know, ebb and flow, I would say. Um, I, I was outspoken and saying, you know, I, I, I can't get all this done in the period of time, and so it would let up a little bit. And then stupid me, uh, something else would look like a law was being violated. They were going after teachers where they didn't have jurisdiction. So stupid me, I'd go and I'd go to the general counsel again and say, well, this doesn't look right. Uh, y y there's no jurisdiction here. 
and there's a court order, um, and uh, it, it appears that we're violating the court order here. Uh, again, got piled up with work, um, moles or hatchet people that were working uh, with the general counsel uh, would also conspire to uh, make sure that now, in addition to all the workload I'd have, um, additional projects that I, were, I was given to do or different assignments was being held back and days before they were due because we actually had to work like on a, a clock the committee of credentials who actually rec makes recommendations for licensing sanctions meets once a month so all this work has to get done by a, a certain deadline so they go into a binder and they go before the committee of credentials they would hold back my work and literally, I wouldn't get. I would get 60 files that I'd have to review in less than two days. And um, and this, uh, you know, I, I would complain about it. And um, I overheard um, one of the um, my coworkers, an attorney, uh, joking with two student assistants how they were doing this on purpose. And ha ha ha! Look at her. She's She's, you know, sighing and, you know, and I started complaining to them. I said, you need to get this to me. This is ridiculous. I know that you guys are going to college and you're only here part time. There's no way you are getting 60 cases done in one day to give it to me. So you need to give it to me, you know, whatever you do, five at a time or whatever, so I can do my job. And uh, they just thought it was a big joke. And um, so I would complain uh, again to my supervisor, who um, at the time was my was general counsel, and um, she said, "Oh well, we'll look into it." So um, I don't know if they looked into it or not, but I questioned, and I said, "You know, this just absolutely needs to stop." And I understand that they're going to uh, my coworker, who is also an attorney. So I stupidly went to HR. I questioned, I said, yeah, this, this is just not right. This is, you know, what I had to realize at some point was that this was purposeful. Um, I was questioning a lot of um, things that they were doing that were absolutely illegal. They were violating laws right and left. They were altering documents, they were admitting um, mitigating factors against teachers. They were going after some teachers and not going after others, depending on whether the school district liked the person, whether they were a family member or not. The nepotism in the agency was unbelievable. Assistant general counsel had daughter and son on the payroll. In my little, the agency's not that big. When you look at state agencies, it's about 150 people. I can't even tell you how many people were either related to it or one another or had uh, friends and family on the payroll. It was, it was absurd. Uh, the vice chair of the Committee of Credentials, his wife was on the payroll. Well, he failed to disclose that in his economic conflict forms. He also failed to disclose it uh, in his interview to the commission. Um, the chair of the commission, she had numerous economic conflicts. There was a brother and sister on the payroll. Uh, someone in HR sister uh, was working in another division and she was up for a promotion and sits on a panel and she's actually one of the panel members that is gonna decide if, this, if her sister gets a promotion or not. <laughs> and um, on and on and on and on. And, um, and there were times when I really thought I was going crazy. I said, you know, I, you know, I'm a lawyer, but you know, this, you know, I, I would spend hours at the law library. I, I kid you not. And at one point, um, our general counsel um, is, and we had this serious backlog of um, misconduct cases, which you may or may not have heard in the news. Um, and um, the general counsel was questioned about that, and she said, "Oh no." Uh, we have a little backlog from time to time, nothing to worry about. And this came right on the heels of the nursing board, and they were basically um, Arnold Clean House. They, there were so many backlogs there that there was nurses stealing drugs, and they were going from hospital to hospital. Anyway, um, needless to say, I reached a breaking point, 
and I made the decision to become a whistleblower. I started out by contacting a law professor. Um, it's an administrative agency. Um, I took administrative law from him, and what I was seeing was administrative law violations, among numerous other violations, and they were altering documents, al al altering or shredding government documents is not just illegal in the civil sense, it it's criminal. Uh, there was so much going on, it was unreal. And, um, and I also contacted the state bar, because I knew the steps I was about to take was very serious. I have health issues, this is a stable job, it provided health care, and I knew that my life uh, was drastically going to change. I didn't know how drastic, but I, I, I knew. I, I wasn't naive. Um, I also contacted Cindy Asias, who was the whistleblower behind Chuck Quackenbush's uh, demise, who was the insurance commissioner that was getting kickbacks and doing all sorts of uh, criminal things. Um, anyway, to make a long story short, I ended up calling the whistleblower hotline, and I was told, instructed, that I would have to go through a legislator. And because of what I was describing, I was told was a program audit. Um, I don't necessarily trust anyone now, but anyway, I did. I went through my legislator, who was Daryl Steinberg, who happens to be the head of the California State Senate. What happens next was absolutely mind-boggling. Um, so I, I had a, a number of uh, phone calls. I eventually get through to his uh, district director. I eventually end up going to the Capitol and go to his office and meet with his chief of staff. And anyway, to make a long story short, um, the commission hired an independent investigator. So um, they misappropriated public funds, and this independent investigator um, was supposed to investigate my concerns. So I get this call out of the blue from Elizabeth Eisen, and on her website, she, uh, oddly enough, it says she's trying to protect healthy workplace environments. Um, she's a lawyer, I look her up on the state bar, and uh, she says that she's been hired to um, meet with me about my concerns. And I said, oh, really? And I said, who hired you? Because <laughs> as a lawyer, I, I know who my client is. It's the agency, the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. So I know who hired her. Is it the people that are violating the law that I'm complaining about? Or is it you know, one person? Is it the agency? Is it the commission? Also, there's issues of confidentiality. And she says, um, well, you know, I'm not quite sure. I said, oh, really, you're not quite sure? <laughs> That's not good. Uh, right there, it's a red flag. <laughs> so I uh, immediately called uh, the general counsel for my union. Uh, the state of California, the state attorneys have a very small union. It's uh, probably only proper uh, named union acronym. It's actually CASE. <laughs> and it, um, it represents California state attorneys and uh, administrative law judges in the state of California. And um, so Patrick Whalen, who's general counsel, actually um, I asked him to accompany me to meet with this woman. I first went to the executive director, who I didn't trust. I didn't trust anyone in the agency, and that's immediately I told the state bar about that. You know, what if the case is I don't trust anyone? And so they literally walked me through how I would initiate a state audit. So I, uh, accomp he accompanied me to meet with her. It was very bizarre. Uh, she was immediately on the defense. She didn't like the fact that I had a witness, but thank God that I actually brought a witness because we, we wrote a, a summary of this interview. She was literally trying to say, so it's not the attorney, she was kind of paraphrasing everything that I was saying. And she was saying, so what I'm hearing you saying is that it's really not the attorney's fault, it's a staff fault. And I was just constantly, 
uh, say, no, that's not what I said. So she was just really uh, there as a hatchet person to kind of attack me and uh, blame staff. And later I found out, because I've now been through discovery, uh, that there's, there were all these transcripts and they had these employees come in and they were, uh, um, you know, uh, there's audio clips of the recordings of the employees and I was just shocked. But in, in some ways I, I was uh, laughing because there's a woman who we've become great friends now. She's worked at the agency for over 30 years. So she also was retaliated against, not only for asking questions and she knew something was wrong, but uh, she testified on my behalf, and so she was literally, she was forced out of her job and had to retire early, and she's uh, suffering economically. But we got all these transcripts and reading them, and in some uh, sense, I was laughing and thinking, my God, I mean, how stupid are they? At one point, they're trying to claim that I was making up my heart transplant. I, I, I <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I, so I, I made it, called my doctor and I made an appointment. I wanted to show him. I said, look at, look at this, at what they're saying. And he's like, he literally almost falls back on his chair and falls out of his chair. He said, you've got to be kidding. I said, no. I said, who are, this is so bizarre. I, again, I was naive and thinking, no one's going to protect these people. These people are gone. I mean, I just, I'm going to get my job back. This is, this is so bizarre, absurd what they're doing. Uh, but uh, there was funny parts of it. I mean, p they picked and choose who they were going to interview and not interview others. For example, we have investigators, and they review school district reports as opposed to just criminal matters. No investigator was interviewed, and that was on purpose because the backlog just didn't include, the front story was it was just rap sheets, and of the rap sheets, it was just low-level crime, so no big deal. Well, that was not true at all. There was mandatory cases that fell through the cracks, uh, very serious criminal offenses uh, where there's no discretion. They, by operation of law, the, the person who holds is revoked, the person who applies is denied. Um, but there was, uh, there, there was all these school district reports that were backlogged. There was cases that had run statute of limitations. And, uh, but more than that, there was serious legal violations, nepotism, cronyism, and very serious conflicts of interest. None of, none of the, except for one, uh, the unlawful delegation of authority, they, they were just running their underground operation. They, they were picking and choosing who they would look at, who they wouldn't, uh, in violation of a California Supreme Court case, which is Morrison versus State Board of Ed. Um, I, if anyone's interested, I think my complaint is online. But to make a long story short, there was an audit. And it, it, it was a whitewash. It, it took me a while to realize what a whitewash it was, uh, because I think I was just in shock, to be honest. I was probably suffering a little post-traumatic stress myself. But Gerald Steinberg's um, education advisor, um, Susanna Cooper, the day that they were going to have the hearing uh, to, um, before the Joint Legislative Audit Committee um, to grant just the request to have the audit, she emails me at work a draft of what she's going to say on Gerald's behalf. So, you know, I find out later that her husband has a nonprofit whose client is the Bureau of State Audits. So, I mean, the complex, just really, really outrageous. Um, but to make a long story short, um, the audit happened. It did not include a number of things, which was the complex. Uh, it did include the nepotism. Um, it, it included, it, in buried in it, there's, there's some the legal violations, but one of the things the auditor recommended was that they get an attorney general's opinion on the issue of unlawful delegation of authority. Well, just fairly recently, the CTC decided, eh, no, nah, we don't need that. We're, we're, we're fine the way we're operating. And one thing I want to say about this whole thing about workplace bullying, or I, I think it's too kind a of word, mental torture, is that What's usually happening, and as a lawyer, I saw numerous legal violations, is there's some illegal activity going on. So if you're experiencing 
bullying or, or mental torture or whatever you want to call it, I bet you dollar to donuts that someone's pillaging public funds, <laughs> someone's violating the law, someone's violating 1090, someone's giving no bid contracts. That's what's happening. The, the explosive proliferation of nonprofits that is pillaging public funds is outrageous. And they are linked, <laughs> and they are linked to government officials. Yeah. And what has to happen is not just a cause of action to have mutual respect or whatever. There needs to be criminal prosecution of white collar crime. <laughs> Without that, there is going to be no deterrence. The mortgage crisis, the Great Depression. I mean, we, just recently in the news, we heard about a criminal indictment of SAC Capital. How many of you have heard about that? Insider trading. Okay. So no individual is criminally indicted. It's SAC Capital. So they're going to get a forklift. And, and a shovel and put the building in a prison show, cell? What kind of friggin' deterrent is that? We need to go after individuals because if you are being bullied or you are being tortured and, it, and there's collusion amongst your coworkers, and there often is, because that's how they union bust. They divide and conquer. A union can't represent another union member against another union member. That's very wide known. And so what do they do? They divide and conquer you against your coworkers. And that's exactly what they did to me. That's exactly what they've done to numerous teachers and, and other workers. And that's, it's, a perp, it's, it's just a, it, an example. And then you're, what are your options? You have to get a private attorney. Now the union can't represent you. So now you're, they, they uh, economic warfare. But what is always happening is illegality. Behind all of it, you may not be aware of it because you may not be a lawyer, you may not understand all the conflict of interest violations that are criminal violations or the Political Reform Act violations or campaign finance violations or the pillaging of public funds. You may not be aware of what's happening but I know for sure that if you are being bullied, there is illegal action, criminal, happening somewhere in your organization. Yes. And we need to demand prosecution. Not this little touchy-feely, oh, we're going to have a cause of action, oh, we're going to, you know, uh, no. These people need to go to prison and never come out because they're ruining lives. One of our uh, speakers has to uh, leave early, so we're going to give him some time. Uh, is Kenneth um, uh, Martinez Gomez? And for people who don't know, we uh, have had a number of educational conferences around SB 863. Do people know about SB 863? Yes. Okay. Well, that's good that he's going to be coming up here because uh, what they did, what Governor Brown did, and the legislature, and unfortunately our AFL-CIO in California is they allowed a bill passed, 863, that, help, that prevents us from getting compensation. It makes it more difficult to get the compensation for mental uh, duress on the job. And doctors have testified that a growing amount, percentage of workplace injuries are mental health issues, bullying on the job. That that is a growing amount of injuries on the job. And what this legislation does is prevents us, makes it more difficult to get compensation for bullying on the job for mental duress. So let's welcome uh, Kenneth to the, uh, to the speakers tonight. No speaker. Thank you.
Welcome everybody. Thank you for being uh, patient with somebody who's often very impatient. A couple of you know that very well. I represent a couple of you in the audience and there's often uh, tough uh, gut checking when we have to analyze what we want to do publicly and then what can be used against us in the legal setting and there's always that uh, tough decision we have to make but I do want to say that it's very important that each of you act with passion and courage in everything you do. That's what Steve does, and he's proved it time and time again. If you want to know somebody who cares and is there when it's raining and there's one person at the meeting, and me, or there's all of us, and Steve, Steve will be there. So I'd like to give a hand for Steve and all his efforts. <laughs> Now, um, I just want to ask a few things. Um, how many of you have heard of the Legal Aid Society Employment Law Center? Not enough. How many of you have heard of WorkSafe? Nobody, or one person. I suggest that you talk to Steve about this organization and other allies that are there because there's a lot of work that has to be done. And as much as Steve would like to do it all, and he will, um, I think his wife, my wife, and everybody can say we've got to spread the work. So I encourage you to find out who else is there through Steve so that you know it's, it's not just one entity, but there's different organizations that can work with Steve to make things happen. Right now we're working on a translation project for uh, chemical poisoning of farm workers and so forth. So Steve is a go-to guy. But say, hey, Steve, can I help you out sometimes? And that's my pitch for Steve, because he's a good guy. Um, second of all, had anybody ever heard of SB 899? You ever heard of that? One person. Anybody ever heard of SB 863? One other person. How many people, how many people here have a job or have had a job in their lifetime? OK, so those hands should be raised all three times. You need to know what's going on and be informed. Be an informed consumer of your rights at the workplace. You can't just wait on others and just not think this doesn't sound right. You have to know why it's not right and do something about it. That's what Steve does. He gives education, but your responsibility to yourself and others is to do something and become active, not just passive. It's great you're here, but we'd like all of you to volunteer your time to make other things happen like this. Now, what Steve alluded to is very important. Um, there is a major shift in the workers' comp world whereby mental health injuries are treated as second-class injuries. Now, if you can just say to yourself that's not fair, it's not fair. But it's also written into the law. Constitution, equal protection. Somebody with the back injury gets more money than somebody with severe depression, anxiety, ulcers, suicidal ideation, the whole gamut. Does that sound right? No. And does it further sound right that the guy who has a messed up back and can never work again doesn't get any extra money for the fact that his wife left him, he's miserable to be around because he's no longer providing money. But he can't get extra money for being ornery, depressing, and not pleasant to be around. Does that sound fair? That is what the governor thinks is fair. He signed a new law that says if you have resulting depression from major injuries, too bad. See the doctor, but if you can't work anymore because of that, too bad. Your only economic compensation is for your messed up body, but not for your tortured mind. You need to know this. You need to talk to your senators. You need to talk to Steve. Because this is happening right now. That is what SB 863 is. Now, interestingly, a lot of politicians don't read the rest of the law. In the law, we have Government Code Section 111. Three, five. It says no state program shall operate to the detriment or discrimination of protected classes. Guess who the protected classes are? 
those with mental disability. So how is it that the same governor, senators, passed a law in strict contradiction to the U.S. Constitution, California Constitution, and the own government code that says you cannot treat people with mental disability differently? So we're waiting for that to be challenged, but it takes a lot of work because insurance companies have money, right? And if they can save money, they will. If they can scare you, they will. And as an attorney, as a colleague who's here, there are judges who are also bullies. I will not name them because then that's bad for me and the state bar. But I have been with judges, and my wife knows the name, but don't grill her on it. There's a particular judge who finds that it's okay to bully clients, my clients. I have a client that I had to get out of the case because the personal animosity was so bad that the only fair thing to do is switch you over to the Oakland court, get away from San Francisco court to have a second shot. Now, this judge, when I wasn't there and I sent a contract attorney, this judge had the nerve to tell my client, you're a child, you're immature, I gave birth on the last day I came to work, why are you so worried about being pregnant, get on with your life, you're messing up your life, this is a stupid case, it's dragging on forever. Okay, understand that. And it happens behind closed doors, and my contract attorney isn't as bold as me, so he just let it go. I wouldn't have stand up for that if I asked for a court reporter. This happens at court. What happens at court is the following as well as far as discrimination. I used to represent a Latin man who's very dark skinned. He got burned by roofing tar. Imagine there must be scars, right? Even for a dark guy or a black guy, let's say. The doctor who evaluated him said, this guy is so dark, I can't make out the scarring, so I don't see the disability. Now, when I showed it to the judge, I said, I'm just concerned a little bit about some bias. I use the word bias because you don't want to call somebody racist and I have to be careful. The judge said, this doctor's been known for 30 years in the community, you're gonna have a hard time proving he's a racist. But it wasn't just that statement, it was the fact that my guy got scalded, ran around like a chicken with his head cut off, looking for water to douse the tar burning his face. So he twisted his back, banged his head against the pickup truck that was close. And so the doctor discounted all of that as being highly improbable. So that, along with the fact that he was too brown to figure out that he looked ugly now, because brown people can be ugly, was really hard for me to stomach. But as an attorney, and I wanted to keep my state bar license, I told them, move on, get out of this court. So they actually had to buy a home in another county to have a position to say, my case belongs over here now. Also, with mental health disability and a crossover with immigration, if you're an immigrant, if you know immigrants, if you know anybody yourself, born and raised here, you do not need to discuss your residency status with any judge, doctor, or lawyer, unless it's your lawyer, just to talk about things. Because there's another government code, or the labor code, that's called 1171.5. Many, many employers try to intimidate and scare the shit out of people, I'm gonna deport you, because you don't have papers. Well, guess what? You work, you get paid. You get hurt, you get paid no matter what your status. I have doctors, and luckily, judge followed me. Of course, the judge who followed me was a Mexican-American judge. The Mexican-American judge found it sufficient to knock out the doctor and exclude his opinions and also report him to the medical board because my client credibly testified that right after getting his address, name, date of birth, where are your papers? Where's your family papers? How many illegals live with you? Why don't you go home? That's bullying. That's wrong. But it happens, and that's why a lot of people in the underground economy don't come forward and protest their rights to get paid fairly or the right to fair analysis of their mental anguish because of a work injury or a stressful situation. So you need to understand that this is happening, but you have to know the tools with a proper attorney or proper advocacy group like Steve to know how to address this. Because sometimes things become noise without saying, the law says you can't do it, so why are you doing it? 
I have a case right now that I'm going to win on appeal because the judge himself, and I don't blame him. I don't think he's racist. He doesn't know the law. The judge asked my client on the stand, are you here legally? Where are your papers? I objected. He had to talk to the presiding judge, and the presiding judge told him to sustain the objection, meaning my client didn't have to answer. I'm going to prevail on that, but the court-certified interpreter who was there who also does criminal work and civil work, he says, what's up with this judge? Doesn't he read about the law? Because in his 30 years of work as a certified interpreter, he never heard a judge be so bold as to ask somebody where their papers were. I understand. So with bullying, it happens to us as professionals. So if sometimes we're hesitant as your advocates, it's because we're dealing with heat. We put a lot of money into our ticket or into our medical profession, whatever professional degree we have. And we put on the line, it's, it takes courage. So I'm asking all of you to investigate more what's happening with workers' comp. And if the person you talk to, that's supposed to be your leader, doesn't do it for you, then find somebody else who does. Because if you just sit back, everybody has lobbyists. Anybody ever been to Sacramento to lobby? OK, that's good. I like that. You guys talk a lot. You guys fight. That's good, but we need more. Because you know who's there every day? Young kids out of college need to pay their student loans. They're there every day, buzzing in somebody's ear. And it's not always bad. It's just they're always a pest. OK? But they get paid to be a pest. For us, it takes time away from our private practice or from our other activities to go there. So it's important. Politicians do care if the issue is a public issue. And what you're doing here today is excellent. But you have to take this and find somebody who's going to be your buddy and tell Steve, what can we do for you? What can we do for our brothers and sisters? OK? And thank you very much for allowing me to come earlier than later. Thank you, Ken. And obviously, we have our work cut out ahead of us uh, as far as fighting for our rights against the bullying in the workplace, but also uh, fighting for compensation for our injuries. And many of us have been terrorized and, and injured seriously as a result of the bullying that's taking place in the workplace. So we're going to have now a lunch break. Uh, so get some food, and then we'll reconvene.